Okay. First of all, does everybody have five bourbons? Yes. Okay, second of all, for those of you who have them set up like bowling pins, one, two, three, four, five. Howdy, my name is Zeke. Thanks all for coming out and stuff like that. We have a wonderful night that is exactly like it is in Louisville or Frankfort, Kentucky, or Bardstown. We're doing five bourbons that are all coming from the same distillery. And that's the sort of thing where I found most intriguing in that, unlike my under, I don't know all that much about scotch, but my understanding is that each distillery only makes one type of whiskey. In America, all bets are off on that. There's, where'd my paper go? Who's seen? No, no, no. There it is. Yeah, there is. From Buffalo Trace, there are Ancient Age, Benchmark, Lantern's Buffalo Trace, the Buffalo Trace Experimental Collection, Eagle Rare, Elmer T. Lee, George T. Stagg, Hancock's Reserve, Old Charter, Charter, Rock Hill Farms, Sazerac, Thomas H. Handy, Rye, Van Winkle, and Happy Van Winkle, Bourbons and Rise, W.L. Weller, and very frequently. Just hold on a bit with the uh, echo. Okay, uh, no problem. I take, it though, I take it though that you can hear me. I oh, know we, we can hear you. Just you want me to be slower. Just slower for the echo. It's a little bit of adrenaline at the beginning. Uh, After the first glass, it should be fine. <laughs> And yet, yeah, each of those, uh, what's called labels, sometimes has three, four, five different expressions. Sort of thing with like Blanton's, they have four different expressions. They have Blanton's, they have Blanton's uh, Select Reserve, they have Blanton's Gold, they have Blanton's Silver, and Blanton's Select. And so, it's the sort of thing where my thoughts upon initially doing the research were, I figured it was all due to the mash bill. How many of you know exactly how whiskey is made? Okay. For what about the, sorry that I would be repeating information you know. Uh, basically, in order to make whiskey, you take some, basically anything you want that has sh sugars in it. You can make it out of less. Yeah, actually, whiskey, you gotta start with grain, so let's stick with that. You do grain, you stick it into what you want, the water, boil it so that it becomes a sort of sludge, you toss in some yeast, it starts to ferment, there's some chemical reactions in there where the sugar is turning into alcohol, and it's, that's basically making beer. In Scotland, that thing is called a wort. In the States, it's called a mash bill. The main difference between the wort and the mash bill is that in the wort, because in Scotland, for the most part, they use uh, pot stills, it's the sort of thing they need to get rid of all the, the, all the, all the grains. They just need a liquor because once you stick it into the pot, still it makes a mess. In, uh, with a mash bill, because they're using column stills. I'm not gonna get into the difference between pot stills and column stills, but because they use column stills, they can just dump the whole thing, which is sort of like a porridge or a sludge, right into the still, and at which point then at the bot back at the bottom, they clean it all out. Am I speaking slow enough that the echo is working? Okay, and then also, by the way, if anybody has questions, en français or in English, interrupt me at any time. There is a sort of idea of how I'm gonna go through this, but we can, we don't have to go the straight line. Um, and so yeah, once you put it into the uh, distill, it takes that beer, the whole idea is just to then get rid of a lot of stuff and bring up the amount of alcohol. In the United States, they then distill it twice. Once to get it up to somewhere about 40% alcohol, and then a second time to get it up to about, and depending on who it is, don't quote me on this, somewhere about, I think, 55 to 70% alcohol. In the States, it's made more complicated in the same way that here we have a metric system, and down there they use the imperial system. Down there they use proof, and here we use alcohol by volume. Uh, somehow proof just sounds a lot tougher. It's the sort of thing where yeah, if you look on any of the bottles, actually let's take one of these bottles. If you go to your SAQ and you find some sort of fancy one, you'll notice that, and here I can pass this one around as well, this is the Blanton's. Notice that it's crossed out. 
because the SAQ or the RCAA JQ or whatever it is doesn't want people getting confused. You want to pass this around there? Also, while you're looking for the plant, so it has hand labeled hand, all sorts of notches. They would want hand done on that. That's a handmade whiskey. Um, we, see, whiskey American. Yeah, the whiskey Canadian. Yeah, the règlements que le gouvernement canadien dit que ça c'est ce qu'il faut faire pour être une whisky canadienne. Pour les Écossais, il y a des règlements de Scottish Whisky Association. Je pense que tu as how long are the rules? Okay. It's not that long. It's about okay. uh, two pages. You have to read it. It's very short. Okay. And the rest is a pretty much the same thing. No, 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 no. Uh, for bourbon, for bourbon, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sentences. Irlande, Irlande aussi, ils ont leur règlement. In order to be, and we'll get back to distillation, if somebody reminds me, as I said, we're taking a circuitous route. Uh, bourbon must be made of a grain mixture that is at least 51% corn. In order, normally when you're making scotch, you use just malted barley. When, for those of you who remember the Irish whiskeys, they start mixing grains up, but they distill each grain individually. Canada is sort of like Ireland, but we haven't gotten there yet, so I'm not going to talk about them. In America, they toss the grains all into the same vat, into all the same things. So you have corn, you have barley, you have rye, sometimes you have wheat, and, and yeah, that's it. Then also, bourbon must be stilled at no more than 160 proof, 80% alcohol by volume. Then uh, all the bourbon in America, you can't put anything else into it. You can't put coloring, you can't put flavoring. It's got to be pure. Uh, it's got to be aged in new oak charred barrels. That is the sort of thing which, in doing the research for this, blew my mind. Was in, and I'll get to that later. Uh, bourbon must be entered into the barrel at 62.5% alcohol by volume, 125 proof. And bourbon, like other whiskeys, may not be bottled at less than 80 proof. Sort of thing, we're looking around at the Blantons. The Blantons is, which one, 80%, 40% liquor by volume, that's 80 proof. That's as low as it, as low as it gets. Um, bourbon that has been, meets, has done all of that, and has been aged for a minimum of two years, maybe, but is not required to be called straight bourbon. Bourbon that, straight bourbon that is aged for a period of less than four years needs to have a age statement on it. And then the, if the age is stated on the label, it's gotta be the youngest whiskey in the bottle and only whiskey produced in the US can be called bourbon. You can't make bourbon up here. Those are the nine things. It's, uh, which one? Uh, on May 4th, 1964, the United States Congress recognized bourbon whiskey as a distinctive product of the United States, and then the Federal Standards of Identity for Distilled Spirits, Code of Federal Regulations, Title 27, Part 5, Subpart C, list those nine sentences off. <laughs> And it's also, it's a similar process to use a handful. Something like a wall. Uh-huh. That's, that's the sort of thing which, to me, it's yet the lumber industry when they're making these rules. It was large, they said, ah, you got to use new barrels and we're going to have some business. And then as things have gone on, it's, you have, uh, it, it isn't the case with Buffalo Trace, the company that owns uh, these, which is actually Sazerac is the company. But you take a company like a Bean Global, where they own a lot of distilleries in Scotland, they own a lot of distillery, or they own some distilleries in the United States. So they just use the barrels in Kentucky, they ship them off to Scotland, and everybody goes home happy. Um, back to distilling, the sort of thing where it gets, basically the idea is to take out the water, get that alcohol in there. And then, once it is distilled, it's then stuck into barrels. And this is where the sort of thing that I found most fascinating was initially, as I said, you figure the recipe, the mash bill, is gonna be the main reason why this bourbon 
tastes this way and that bourbon tastes this way. Not the case. There's actually, among the five, there are two bourbons up here that are the exact same bourbon. They just have two different labels. The difference is one is aged two years longer and comes from an entirely different warehouse in an entirely different part of the warehouse. In, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow that here. Let me have this. You have in your, that's the page, and it's in your hand now. That's how bourbon is stored. It's the sort of thing where, in Scotland, my understanding is that they basically have these long, low warehouses. They try and tell you that it's terroir, that it's these Scottish lowlands, the highlands, whatever it is that causes the flavor and stuff like that. I'll let somebody else try and figure out if that's actually the case. In uh, Kentucky, and actually in the, yeah, Kentucky, where most of the bourbon is made, you have a nine-story warehouse. Temperature is pretty much like it is here today, and in the summertime. And it's the sort of thing where the difference in temperature between the ground floor and the ninth floor is like the difference in temperature here between the ground floor and the seventh floor, which is why we're only on the third floor tonight. And it's also the sort of thing that because each warehouse faces differently, uh, has, it has different types of, uh, is made out of different types of things. Each one just yet yeah, changes dramatically. And that was the one thing in the research discovering was that in actual fact, where the mash bill, the recipe, probably counts for 10% of the flavor, maybe 20% of the flavor. I'm not exactly certain how you cut it, but the aging, it being in the barrel, easily is 50%, if not more. The plant that's going around is a single barrel burner. The Hancock's Reserve, Presidential Reserve, is a single barrel bourbon. That means that basically they take one barrel, they dump it, they stick it, they uh, bottle it, and they ship it out. The Blanton's actually tells you which barrel number, which rick, where in the rick it was. They get a little bit cheaper with the Rock Hill Farms and the Hancock's Reserve. They don't say that, but there are various other ones which do have the handwriting and so on. And you will be able to taste the difference. And it's a sort of thing with the two that are the same. They're just coming from different places. It's, yeah, they're sort of like twi the twins. Where it's, yes, they look similar, but once you get to know them, they are completely different. Um, then yes, as far as the history of American whiskey, is yet a sort of thing where, if you can tell, while I have in the handouts, a lot of much more flavor wheels and stuff like that. Given that the back in the tasting notes, it's the sort of thing where I've gone through a bunch of tasting notes and realized that everybody's taste is different. And even when you have somebody like a Jim Murray who writes whiskey books for a living, or a Michael Jackson who writes about taste for a living, they will say two completely different things about the same exact whiskey. So at which point, to me, the idea of having this is what it tastes like. Now that's where I go up to the chemistry, where it's the sort of front thing with all those much more complicated names. Those are the actual chemicals that do have a sense. But ultimately, to me, it's a leave it up to you as to decide how you think each bourbon tastes. Okay. You think it's time for cake? You think it's time for the first taste? Yes. Okay. <laughs> This is Buffalo Trace. It comes in at 45% alcohol by volume, which is 90 proof. It's the flagship brand. It costs, I think, $40 at the SAQ, although they probably still have a bunch that have uh, what the tags on them. You get a $4 discount, get it for $36. Um, it's made out of what they say is here. Because you have Buffalo Trace only has five different recipes, 
Uh, yes, they're the higher corn. This is made with about 80% corn. It's then got uh, rye and barley as the other ones. I'll let you all taste it, sniff it. Yes. Can we put water into it? Like you can do any damn thing you want to it. <laughs> it's not, I do. Should I do it? Whatever, whatever you feel comfortable with. I've been just talking with a friend. It's sort of thing. Normally, if I'm doing a tasting at home, I will put out five different glasses of the same whiskey. One that has straight whiskey, one that has water in it, one that has ice in it, one that has soda in it, one that has been hanging out for a day and a half. Taste all of them to see which one I prefer. Unfortunately, the tasting like this is the sort of thing where once you stick the water in it, you can't take that water out. <laughs> and so I'd say taste it straight. If it tastes strong, if somehow you're not quite keen on it, toss a little bit of water on it, see if it makes it any better. If you like it as is, do it, uh, what do, you do it straight. Sort of thing also with tasting for the professional tasters, where this has 40%, 45% alcohol by volume. If you're going to some sort of uh, competition, they will water down all the whiskey to about 20% alcohol by volume, just so that, because yeah, the way it is this way, Alcohol just basically attacks your nose. And so, however is comfortable. And so who smells what now? So what? Oh, yeah. What, what, what's the nose? Who <laughs> tastes what? Consistently the same year to year to year. 
it is the sort of thing that they can be fairly consistent, although in, again, doing the research, they change shit all the time. It is the sort of thing, the Buffalo Trace itself didn't get invented until 1999, and it's sort of the, the distillery itself that has gone through a dozen name changes, and labels and marks and expressions come and go like uh, what call women's uh, fashion. So it's the sort of thing that, um, yeah, they try and give you this sort of sense, oh, this has been around for a while. Uh, enjoy it, drink it, and keep your fingers crossed that it'll show up, especially with the SAQ, because I remember last summer with Jim Bean, which is a comparable bur bourbon, I just like it because it's in the 40 pounder as opposed to the 26 ouncer. And at which point, last summer, they got to a point where there were only eight bottles of Jim Beam in the entire province. And the idea that that would happen, I just <laughs> left me scratching my head. And so, if you like it, Jim Beam, you put it with the studies. Pardon? Jim Beam, you put it with the studies. No, ils ont, euh, ils ont ce qui fait avec le service, ils ont aussi le Jim Beam White Label, ils ont euh, le Jim Beam Black Label, ils ont aussi une chose qui s'appelle Dance Cut, alors que Beam Global c'est une compagnie assez gros que Buffalo Trace, ils ont plusieurs autres marques aussi. Yes? What's it mean again when it says straight? Straight means that it has been aged for a minimum of two years. Okay, there's one of those nine sentences in the 1964 law that was saying this is how you make bourbon. And so when you look at it here, this one says Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, which can tell me that this has been aged for at least two years, more likely at least four, because once it is straight, if it is aged for four years, or less than four years, then they've got to put an age statement on it. And then after four years, they don't. So there, I happen to know this is roughly about seven years. It's not exactly, they don't say, oh, this is the day, this is the time, let's dump it. They do all do it by tasting. But roughly after seven years, this is what you get. But is there, is there bourbons like age less than two years? Yes. Uh -huh. You have a Kentucky Street. Yeah, this one here, single barrel Hancock's President's Reserve Bourbon Whiskey. It doesn't say straight at all, which means that this could be, it probably is, a very, very young whiskey. And they're, they're just sort of saying, okay, so we got the single barrel, everybody seems to be going gag up over the marketing of the single barrel. But once you take away the label straight, then at which point it means it was in there, then they took it out. You have here. No, no, no. Straight. No, no, no. After straight, less than four, you have to put the age statement. Two years gets you straight. If you don't, if you don't have straight, it's younger than two. And the same here with the Rock Hill Farms. Single barrel bourbon. It's the sort of thing that has no. Oh, no, on the back it says Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Yeah, who's got the Blanthers? Uh, Is there any left? <laughs> does it say Does it say straight on it? Sorry. Est-ce qu'il est marqué Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey? Okay. No choice to get it. If they write it, they have to do it. If they don't write it, they don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. That's why you actually have bourbon, but that is not bourbon like Tennessee whiskey, Jack Daniels. No, no, no. It is bourbon. Almost every law, but they choose not to write bourbon on it, but it is still bourbon. You could pass it as bourbon. They, they prefer to use called Tennessee whiskey just because it differentiates. There isn't a difference in the filtering? Yeah. Oh, no, they, they, had, they had a filtering process, but yeah, yeah, no, no, where, no where it's not. Old Fitzgerald is a bourbon that is filtered the same way as Jack Daniels. Same way as Jack Daniels. No, it's the, the Lincoln County process. It, it doesn't say anything about which one filtering, charcoal filtering in the regulation. So you can do anything you want as long as you follow those nine sentences. Narada, you had a question? No, that was okay. No, it's sort of thing where I used to think when I was growing up that uh, bourbon had to be made in Kentucky, not to be made anywhere in the United States. It just so happens that about eighty percent of it is made in Kentucky where there used to be, say, 10 years ago, probably about uh, 20 distilleries 
Now there are like 750, and they're doing all sorts of strange things. It's also the sort of thing where besides bourbon, you can have corn whiskey, you can have rye, you can have weeded whiskey, and you can have just plain whiskey. Regulations for something rye, where most people think rye is Canadian whiskey. On this side of the border, the regulations are rather slack and loose. Basically, my understanding is it just has to be distilled, aged, and bottled above the 49th parallel, and at which point you can call it Canadian whiskey. Down south, in order to call it rye, in the same way that bourbon needs to be made out of 51% corn in the mash bill. If you make it 51% or more rye in the mash bill, then you can call it Kentucky straight rye whiskey or Kentucky, uh, Pennsylvania straight rye whiskey. If you uh, what do you make it out of wheat, where the 51% is wheat, then at which point it's weeded whiskey. There's a very, very nice whiskey that they have at the SAQ, and because it's very obscure, it's mostly in stock, but there's this thing called burn Arms, which is a weeded whiskey, which is, you're not going to... It's not it's wheat. Yeah, not it's, it's, wheat. yeah it's, it's a wheat whiskey, but it's still, it's got more than 51% wheat as its main ingredient in the mash bill, and Chloe, you're not going to like it, it's very, very sweet. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, back to how whiskey started with them in America, is uh, you had their, before you even had the, uh, what do you call it, the revolution, you had all sorts of uh, immigrants coming across, and sort of thing where, once the country was sort of settled, they started giving away land. It was sort of thing, they wanted to settle it, they wanted to beat the crap out of the Indians, they wanted to take it over and just say it's ours. And so, uh, basically, you'd have a lot of people going across from Virginia, which was one of the 13 original colonies, or 13 original states, and they were giving away land. Uh, I think something like about 40, uh, don't hold me on it, they're giving away land. One of the regulations was if you wanted to claim the land is you had to plant an acre of corn. Which was a fair bit of corn. And then it's a sort of thing where given that money was, yeah, they had all sorts of different types of ways of uh, not the buying and selling things, trading, bartering, and so on. It's a sort of thing where you'd have corn, and well, corn was mostly, and still for the most part, is used to feed animals. It's the sort of thing where you can mill it and turn it into small little pieces and then you can bake it, you can make cornbread, you can feed your animals easier and so on. The mills very frequently would just say, okay, so you give us 10 bushels of corn to be milled, we're going to charge you one bush bushel. And then it's the sort of thing where one bushel, which I think is so the equivalent in size of about 35 liters or so. Again, don't quote me on that, but it's, it's not immense, but it's not small sort of thing where uh, by distilling the corn you would be able to get it down to a much smaller more manageable volume and at which point that could be transported plus because you got drunk off of it there were people who wanted to buy it and you could then once they're drunk you could probably charge them a lot of money for it and so on and so everybody basically had their own distilling or new a distiller it was one of the regular things you did like having a garden or uh, raising a cow so you could have milk and stuff like that as the country gets more and more country, they start sticking in taxes and it's the sort of thing where uh, they start saying, if you're gonna do this, then you gotta do this. They put in laws. Uh, there's this thing in, where is it? I think it's on this page. Yes, 1791. Uh, because uh, they needed to pay off the debts incurred by the Revolutionary War, they instituted a whiskey tax. It was basically, the guys, cities it was designed to be paid easily by large manufacturers of whiskey and uh, difficult to pay for small manufacturers of whiskey. And so there's this thing called a whiskey rebellion which started in western Pennsylvania. It's got a great name and there has been a whole myth about it that because of the whiskey rebellion basically a bunch of people said no we're not paying taxes and uh, we the government sent in militia there's a standoff and a uh, whole blue ha ha happened about it. From that, it was a sort of thing where a lot of people started to think that, oh, the guys from Western Pennsylvania who were part of the Whiskey Rebellion moved to Kentucky. In actual fact, that wasn't the case. The guys from the uh, Whiskey Rebellion from Western Pennsylvania went down to Louisiana, 
and the people in Kentucky who have been distilling for years and years and years, continue distilling for years and years and years. The two are not terribly, uh, not the, are not linked at all. The way that bourbon got its name, because there was a certain thing where once you distill it, most of the time you're drinking what would now be considered, uh, which one, the white dog, which is unaged hooch. It's the sort of thing you go to, uh, which one, you go to the SAQ, you buy some alcohol, you know, that stuff which is 95% and 92% alcohol. They didn't have stills that could get it up to that high, but they had stills that could probably get it up to about 60 to 70% alcohol. And at which point, you just drink it at the time, they'd be adding all sorts of stuff to it so as to make it palatable. That's how you get gin, which is basically you take your alcohol, you toss in some juniper berries, uh, that sort of thing. You just add all sorts of flavorings in, and at which point, yeah, it tastes better than it did, and, and it still gets us drunk. Wicked cool. Um, it's the sort of thing that there was uh, these guys, yeah, down the boat. Most of my stuff is based off of this wonderful book that was written by this guy, Mike Beach who had just come out with a book called Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey. And it's a small thing, about 150, 200 pages. And it gives the entire history of how bourbon, what bourbon, why bourbon, and everything like that. I highly recommend it to you if anybody is wanting to get more detail than what I would be able to give tonight. Um, yeah, there's these guys where, the, what are their names? Cascone. Tarascon brothers. They came from just outside of Cognac. And it's the sort of thing where Cognac is a distilled alcohol made from wine that is stuck into burnt barrel, charred barrels in France. And there, I don't know my French history well enough, but apparently there was a king over there who was uh, doing terrible, terrible things. And so the Tarascon brothers uh, came to the United States. And they were just basically brokers. They would buy low and sell high. And because there was the tax on the whiskey, once you made it, you had to pay the tax. And so it's the sort of thing people would prefer. And over the course of time, there has been all sorts of things about how long can we keep the bourbon before we have to pay the tax. And once we get into the 1950s, there's some hilarious machinations and lobbying that goes around. But anyhow, the Ta Tarascone brothers apparently uh, were able to buy the whiskey that was just made by the various farmers, the mills, or whoever it was, and there they would then store it because they had bought it, and at which point they'd put it into charred barrels, which they're stealing from cognac, and they'd sell it to people down in Louise in New Orleans. And there, if you look at it, I think it's the, the next page. After this, you have the maps. The first map gives you an idea of Montreal is in the upper right hand corner, Frankfort, Kentucky is in the bottom center. It's about 1,450 miles from here, I think it's going to take probably about two and a half days to drive. That bottom map shows you going from Louisville down to New Orleans. And if you see, uh, sorry that my printing was lousy, but on that just to the left of the dark line, going through Memphis, you can see sort of a slight gray line. That's the Mississippi River. And it's basically the sort of thing where apparently, according to Mike Veach, who's done the research, he would take, they would take the alcohol that was, they'd be storing in charred oak barrels, stick it on a ship, put it on the Mississippi River, and sell it down in New Orleans. And at which point, that's it. How that's how bourbon became bourbon, and yeah, and then because there was Bourbon Street, Bourbon County in Kentucky as well, which is all based on the bourbon fa family from France and stuff like that, they just ended up calling it bourbon whiskey as opposed to just whiskey and so on. Um, ready for tasting number two? What, what time is it, by the way? Okay. Let me know if you guys want me to go faster, slower, or anything like that. All right, now we're doing Eagle Rare, which is a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. It's been aged 10 years. See that on the back here? Yeah, aged 10 years on the back. Uh, 
This is again marketing brouhaha. They say here, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the cornerstones of the birth of a nation epitomized by the American ball of the eagle. The nation has come to represent the freedom, spirit, and independence of the individual, giving the world products and innovations that are uniquely its own. One such innovation was Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Early Kentucky said, yada, yada, yada. Basically, they call it Eagle. We're trying to say that it's go America, go America. Buffalo Trace is named Buffalo Trace because back in Kentucky, before everybody went around and killed all the buffalo, they would go all, all over the place, and they'd basically make trails, and they'd follow the trails, and given that Frankfurt is right near, is on, the, on a river, sort of thing, they'd come down to the river so as to, uh, which I'll drink, and they'd leave a whole path, and then once the first settlers came, they'd follow these paths because it's pretty much the path of least resistance, and the buffalo paths were called buffalo traces because they were traces of buffalo. This one is... This one. 45% alcohol by volume, 90 proof as well. So should give you a hint. Anybody would? Yes. Is this the the base? No. The alcohol by volume. Okay. No. The Sassy Apple was 70, 80, the mash film. They have a 70, 80, 80% of maïs. A peu près quoi, 20% euh, large et le reste euh, ils sont du ride, du ciel. So, who gets what out of the nose here? With water, I get honey. Pardon? With water, I get a lot of honey. Okay. No, wrong. What's the purple nose? I see mint. Now, they, they call it, from their website, uh, complex aromas of toffee, hints of orange peel, herbs, honey, leather, and oak. Uh, Michael Jackson says it's a soft, clean nose. Robert Parker says it's a sensational Kentucky Street bourbon whiskey. Um, lots of caramelized citrus, maple syrup, smoky creme brulee, and cappuccino-like notes. Or 
they or it could be ancient. They have, as I said, they have what's it, another 13. It could be ancient age. It could be Elmer T. Lee. It could be um, old. Yeah, they, but they could call it broken blend. Uh, there's a sort of thing where, as long as the mesh built and the aging are fine, there's no need to say blended. It's a sort of thing where, once you make it as bourbon, it is bourbon, and you can combine whatever you want. It isn't like scotch where you have to, scotch says it's got to come from one distillery and so on. There is a small difference with Americans where you have bottled and bond, which gets back to the taxes. It's a sort of thing where, this whole idea of paying taxes as you made it, it's sort of like sales tax. And it's a sort of thing where, when we first put in the GST and the QST, there is all sorts of people that raised a big stink about it. Back then, they did it as well. And so, then as the companies themselves got larger and larger and larger, it was a sort of thing where they told, went to the government and said, hey, well, how actually, it's, your, it's, it's the bourbon industry that passed for one of the warehouses. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, yes, yeah, so that they don't have to pay the taxes immediately. And it's the sort of thing they said, hey, we can put it in some place where you guys can look at it. Then at which point, do you trust us to not pay the taxes until whatever the time is? And initially it started out two years. By uh, the 1950s, it ended up 50, uh, 20 years. But I'll get to that later, assuming we still have enough time, because I realize I am going very slowly here. But it's the sort of thing where by bottled and bond, they then came up with these things where it had to be, which one, the bottle at 100 proof, 50% alcohol by volume. It had to be made in one distilling season, which because of the way the American whiskey economy or whiskey business works, it's for Buffalo Trace, they'll say, okay, we're gonna do this mash bill on this day, we're gonna do this mash bill on this day. It's not the sort of thing where they make the same thing every single day. And that's an offshoot of the whole idea where basically, your farmer, once your corn is grown, it's milled, then it's time to distill it. So at which point, initially a distilling season was April to October. Now is, we've had more industrial types of things. The distilling season is January to December. But bottled and bond means basically one distilling season, 100 proof, and one distiller. It's the closest thing you can get to single malt bourbon. Because the rules are somewhat the same. I'm trying to follow where your explanation because I, I again miss and um, understood what you were explaining oh, right now. Okay, no, in terms of the bottled and bond, which oh. is that we've got off the topic on taxes, okay. and it's a sort of thing where yeah, yeah. by putting it in bond, you don't have to pay the taxes immediately. You can pay them when you sell the whiskey as opposed to when you make the whiskey. And if you sold the whiskey, then at which point you have cash, you can give it to the government, and everybody goes home happy. C'est similaire, c'est une chose, c'est une chose spéciale avec le blanc. Ils disent oui, ça va changer du goûter à goûter. Ce goûter ne va pas goûter le même que que tu achètes au euh, SAQ Signature aujourd'hui. Et si tu l'achètes en Californie, ça va changer le goût entièrement. Mais ils préfèrent que tout soit, ils sont assez similaires. Et c'est une chose que, avec les Eagle Rare, ils prennent tous d'une section du Rick House, du Montreux et le faire, et je pense que quoi, Hancock et le Rock Hill Farms sont d'une autre place dans l'entrepôt. Je ne sais pas exactement où ils étaient. Ça, c'est une chose que j'ai n'ai pas eu de chance de le chercher, de le trouver. OK? Et so, yeah, the history of taxing whiskey basically at the beginning follows the history of American wars. After they paid off the Revolutionary War, 
they got rid of the uh, tax, they had the rebellion. Then a couple years later, they had the Civil War, at which point they instituted the tax back again. It started off at 20 cents per gallon. It, by the end of the war, it went up to eight, uh, went to $2 per gallon. And then once the Civil War finished, what they call the Gilded Age of American Whiskey happens. And that's the sort of thing where now it's, if you go into these fancy schmancy cocktail bars and you see the mixologists with their mustaches and stuff like that, they're harking back to the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s when it just seemed like everybody was going around getting drunk. But it was the sort of thing that also caused the whiskey distilling had not gotten to the point where it is today. The sort of thing that's where they invented cocktail. The first cocktail being the old fashioned where you add sugar, you add a little bit of um, carbonated water and some bitters, which are basically infused, al uh, infused alcohol. And the whole idea being you want to make the alcohol itself taste better. And sort of thing, where at that time, whiskey wasn't quite as good tasting as it is. Um, yeah, back uh, about, uh, in 1879, this guy Frederick Stitzel patents the Rick warehousing system, because initially, I think you've probably seen in some of JF's slides where in Scotland and elsewhere they just pile the barrels up, and at which point they put them into like pyramids. That actually puts an awful lot of pressure on the bottom barrels, and as a consequence, you can get lots and lots of leakage, you can get things breaking, uh, and so on. So this guy who had a warehouse decided, I'm gonna come up with this way where basically in the Rick house you have three rows with sort of like railroad tracks on it. And so manipulation of the barrels becomes easier. One of the things I like is where somebody explains how barrels were sort of like the forklifts of the 18th and 19th century. And it's the sort of thing where you think about it, where barrel, barrels for uh, bourbon and for most whiskeys these days are 53 gallons, which is oh, going to be 250 odd liters or something like that. They're big. And you can put just about any damn thing you want into them. You can put in sardines, you can put in pickles, you can put in nails, whatever. But it's the sort of thing where you have 250 liters of nails. It's not something you can just sort of carry around with you. But once you put it on the side, you can roll it. And one person can manipulate it very well. And it isn't until the uh, invention of the forklift and pallets that you don't need barrels anymore. Um, yeah, 1906. The uh, first, which called the uh, food regulation law takes place in the United States, which is called the Pure Food and Drug Act. And it was a sort of thing where it made it illegal for the manufacture, sale, or transportation of adulterated or misbranded or poisonous or deleterious foods, drugs, medicines, and liquors. And that was because at the time, since there was no real regulation on what was whiskey, it was just basically this was hooch that was going to get you, get you high. It was the sort of thing you had people who were caring about how they made it, and they would be making it from, which one, uh, doing the bottled and bond stuff and like that, and coming up with, they put, taking care of it. And you'd have other people who would take what's called grain neutral liquor, which is effectively vodka or alcohol. They'd start adding stuff to it. They'd be putting in colors. There's certain times where, yeah, there's one uh, recipe book which talks about how you add creosote which is the stuff they use to put on railroad ties so as to get a certain flavor in there. And there are other people who are sticking in sulfuric acid and so on, and at which point there are lots of people. Plus also, when you're distilling, the uh, methanol, the first type of alcohol, which is wood alcohol that comes out of the still, if you drink that, you're going to go blind and possibly die. And given that uh, life was cheap back in those days, there were lots of people doing that. Attention. So in 1906, they come up with this pure food, pure food and drug act. The next big thing is prohibition. And uh, we have to thank World War I for why prohibition. This is where also the thing that sort of, sort of struck me, given that all Scotch whiskey these days is made with used bourbon barrels. And I think, so what the hell did Scotch whiskey taste like in 1915? Because 1915, they must, or look, well, 1925, sorry about that, when there was prohibition, there were no bourbon barrels going off to Scotland. And it's a square thing. I wasn't alive then, so I have no idea. Mostly sherry and burgundy. Because the, uh, the English, mm -hmm. specifically the English, really like their, uh, 
inspiring to work with, and they're uh, sharing the work with them. And they're, they're also venture guests that apparently, my guess would be that scotch tastes better out of bourbon barrels, because if it tastes better out of sherry or eclair, then they'd be still using that stuff. But they decide on bourbon barrels. Anyhow. Um, cheaper, it's just cheaper. Mm -hmm. It would all still be cherry, cherry. Now, they're also talking about the barrels. There are four different types of chars you can do, which is basically uh, based on the length of time. When somebody talks about toasting a barrel, it's the sort of thing that is just heated so as to warp the wood. It does impart some change in the wood so as to give some flavor and stuff like that, but it really doesn't have any burn on it. And there, if you sort of think about if you stick a marshmallow on a fire and it suddenly starts burning, that's that's a char, and it's the sort of thing where the char number one is somewhere about 15 to 20 seconds on the barrel, and it's basically they put the barrel on a Bunsen burner or a gas burner. 15, 20 seconds, it graduates up to a char number four is about a minute, and it's the sort of thing where it basically the char number one is very light, probably. 1 16th of an inch of burning on the barrel, and the turn number four is probably somewhere about the eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch. Don't quote me exactly on this, but just to give you an idea of what it is. And it's the sort of thing where it's one of the reasons why um, American bourbons, if you notice, where everybody else is getting rid of their age statements, and the whole idea that older is better, most bourbons do not have age statements on them. And it's the sort of thing where if you leave bourbon in charred oak for a long time, it ends up tasting really crap. And it's the sort of thing where there are only certain select ones where, yeah, Blanton's do. The reason it started was because Colonel Blanton, who was head of the Buffalo Trace Distillery at the time, would uh, tell some guys, I want that barrel and then bottle that so I can give it out to friends and stuff like that. And then 50 years later, they said, we need a push because uh, we the bourbon sales are not doing real well, so let's do some marketing nonsense and come up with a single barrel stuff. And at which point, that's how they came. But there is certain barrels that are sweeter. They're called the honey barrels, which are the ones that are preferred. My guess is, while I like Hancock and Rock Hill Farms very, very much, it's the sort of thing that they in certain cases, they're probably not from honey barrels, especially given that they don't have the word straight on them. <laughs> or they might be from honey barrels, but just uh, a little bit younger and so on. It's about 8.20 now. It don't say that. Oh, okay, so I'll keep talking. Somebody let me know when it's 8.15 and we'll go for the bourbon number three. Um, with Prohibition, it's the sort of thing where um, there's this whole sort of it's very similar to the Tea Party these days. It's one of the things in doing the research for this that struck me was it's same old, same old, same old, over and over and over again. And so you had some reactionary people who were trying to say, okay, so stop with the drinking, stop with the getting drunk, this is how you gotta act, which is, I, are there any important candy people here? Good, okay, before I start putting my foot or pissing somebody off, sort of in there a little bit right wing and it was back the same then. The thing was, because the whole uh, temperance movement started around the 1870s, 1880s, it was a sort of thing, given that there was a whole large German immigrant population in the United States and in Canada as well, the sort of thing you had, uh, what about King, uh, Kingston was, I think, called Berlin or something like that, when it first uh, opened, or when it first started as a town. It was the sort of thing where, given that there's a lot of German beer brewers, it, the temperance movement was seen as being anti-German and stuff like that. But then suddenly you get World War I where the Germans are the bad guys, and at which point it's okay to say we don't give a shit about Germans, and at which point, bam, the temperance movement kicks in, and uh, you have prohibition. There are only six distilleries that are allowed to continue making alcohol. At the time, which one? The, no, I did not make the cut, but I think at the time, somewhere just before Prohibition, there was something like 2,000 distilleries just in Kentucky. There were small distilleries, probably very much like the craft distilleries you see these days, but that's all just in Kentucky. Uh, there, once Prohibition kicked in, they realized, okay, we still got to make food medicine. So it was a sort of thing where uh, pharmacists 
could give prescriptions for one pint of 100 proof whiskey every 10 days. A pint is about, uh, what do you want? Uh, yeah, a pint is a pint, about 500 milliliters. Uh, there, if you were a baker, you could get one pint of rum or brandy per month, per, uh, 12, 12 pints per year, one per month, so as you can make your various, uh, what do you want? The baked goods with rum or brandy. If you were, uh, what is it? Uh, doctors and some, doctors and dentists could also get the 12 pints for office use because alcohol is good for cleaning wounds and stuff like that. Um, Buffalo Trace was uh, basically able to continue making it. They couldn't uh, sell any of the whiskey, but they could make alcohol. Um, back in, and then finally, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gets elected in 1932, and he repeals prohibition, and at which point everybody piles on, but it's the sort of thing where, like with any sort of gold rush, there are all sorts of people who try stuff and then fail. There are other ones who are a little bit more organized, and this is one of the times when uh, Buffalo Trace, which at the time was called the, the Sh Shenley Distillery, uh, which basically bought up all sorts of old brands, uh, old labels, distilleries that weren't doing real well, and became a very, very, very large company. Um, yeah, actually, H8, which is a, a bourbon that I like very much, but is only available in the States. It's one of the things that I like is where Ancient Age initially started out as a Canadian whiskey because their Shenley in the night, by the time it was the 1930s, Shenley being synonymous with Buffalo Trace, they've become international. And since there was no prohibition up here in Canada, they actually made a bourbon style whiskey up here in Canada and then just when Prohibition stopped, they brought it down to ancient age. One of the names for, uh, one of the brands that they used to make was called OFC, which you can still see as a brand. Uh, however, it's a Canadian whiskey, which I just find, <laughs> they just switch things around to suit them. Uh, OFC initially started out as uh, Old Fine Copper, and I think now it apparently stands for Old Fine Canadian. But the idea that you, over time, change things. That's what I say. When you see Buffalo Trace, if you like it, or you see Eagle Rare and you like it, you buy it. For the most part, they're going to want it to be seen. But five years from now, unlikely that it will be the same. It's sort of thing we're just in passing. It's, I don't know if any of you heard about the whole bourbon shortage. And Maker's Mark was going to say that how they're going to lower the uh, proof from uh, which one, 90 proof down to uh, 85 proof because they can better manage the stocks because people are drinking more whiskey these days than you can imagine. And there's a whole big brouhaha about it and everybody's saying, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that. And so they then change their minds, sort of like the new Coke thing. There's also, however, if you go back and you look at Jack Daniels, Jack Daniels 10 years ago was at 90 proof and now it's uh, down at uh, 80 proof. It used to be 45% alcohol by volume and now it's at 80 percent alcohol by volume. I think it's the sort of thing where it depends. Do you announce these things with a press release to try and make news or do you just sort of quietly let it slide? Um, okay, let's try the Blantons. Yes. Which one's number three? Pardon? Which one's number three? Which one? Number three. Left to right? Yes, left to right. Bottom okay. left. Okay, Blanton's is the was the first single barrel bourbon ever made. It was the sort of thing where, um, yeah, fast forward. You have prohibition from the nineteen much more the thirties through until the nineteen sixties, especially as for everybody who's watching Mad Men. As you can see, the whiskey was the best and wonderful thing around. Everybody was drinking it, everybody was having a great time. Sort of thing in about 1970, along with, uh, whatchamacallit, all the unrest and uh, rebellion, rebellious, rebelliousness in the States. Uh, suddenly, James Bond as well kicking in with, uh, whatchamacallit, the martini, shake it, not stirred, and so on. Bourbon falls out of favor, and vodka comes back into style with a vengeance. And it's the sort of thing where um, 
Elmer T. Lee. While there is a whiskey named Elmer T. Lee, I kind of get a kick out of the fact that mostly you can tell the difference, they tell two types of bourbons. There are the ones that are named after what I call Civil War heroes, and there are other ones that are named after angry animals. And unfortunately, the five we selected tonight throws that theory out of, out of the out the window. But it's the sort of thing where Elmer T. Lee was master distiller for the Buffalo Trace Distillery, which at that time in the 70s was called the Shen. No, it's called the Buffalo Trace Distillery. He started there in 49. He remembered that the guy who was president pull out this one thing. And then he had also been hearing it because in the 70s is when single malt whiskeys started to rise. The first single malt whiskey was invented in 1964, I think it was. And basically, he said, let's try this. We can market the heck out of it and we'll see what happens. And uh, it was a hit. It's here. This is this one will taste different every single time you drink a different bottle. What would be the major difference between the bottle and the taste, or the color? Yes, and the color. And the color. Everything. Yeah. Really yeah. Everything. Everything will be different. Although they're given that. Blanton's is on the Rickhouse diagram. It comes from the dead center of Warehouse H. Warehouse H in Buffalo Trace was built in 1935, and it's the sort of thing where because they were just trying to gear up production as quickly as possible, all the other warehouses on the property are in brick buildings. Brick buildings with wood floors in between. Uh, Warehouse H only has carbon metal, so it's basically aluminum, the equivalent of metal siding on a wood framework. And because of the difference in how the building is made, Bourbon ages more or very differently than the other ones. And for Blantons, they take it from the center cut of the uh, warehouse. So who gets what off the nose? Bottom line, get a slate, flinty, honey, it's very dry for what is on a bunch of mushroom maybe. Now this is made out of Nashville number, Nashville number two which is the lower corn. That's the one which has by about 51 to 55 percent corn, more rye and uh, want, uh, and barley in it. Um, oh. Okay, actually, no, I take that back. There it's saying where the first one is probably 70, Buffalo Trace and Eagle Rare, probably 70 to 80 percent corn. Lanthans is 60 to 70 percent corn, with the difference being made up with the rye. Uh, yes, yeah, some of the top contributing aroma compounds include the uh, <laughs> the guaiacols, which add the smokiness, the cresols, which is the barn medicinal scent, the eugenols, which is clove, the furanones, which is caramel, the lactose, which is Coconut and peach and vanillin, which is obviously vanilla. Seems like more is going on, but probably because it's down to forty percent, it seems less intense probably mm -hmm. than the eagle there and the buffalo trace. Now there it's a sort of thing where as I said earlier, there are four different expressions of the bland test. They all are single barrel. It's the difference between them is you can get them at barrel strength, you can get them at uh, which one, 80 percent, uh, 80 proof, 40 percent alcohol by volume, and then there are the two that are in between. I think it's like a 107 and a 95 or something like that. And one of them is only you can only buy that is And then this one, which is the select reserve, you can't buy in the states. This is export only. However, they all are the same thing. It is a sort of thing you have to go back to the distilling. It's it's when they bat it, they decide this is what we're gonna this is what we're making today, whether it's Eagle Rare or Blanton's, and that's when they add the water to bring it down to uh, what you call the bottling fan. So what's the verdict on this? Anybody who, who of the three so far, who thinks Blanton's is the best? Okay. 
Anybody from Eagle Rare? Okay. Yep. So far. And Buffalo Trace. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> The smell, the smell of London is not strong enough. It doesn't give you the excitement of, of tasting it. It's, it's good, but mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have one. Okay. They're, they're also, if you look at the stopper on the plantains, if you notice in the, if you notice on the stopper on the plantains, on the right heel of the horse is going to be a letter. And it's the sort of thing where there are eight different stoppers. And if you drink enough Blantons, you can collect all the letters you spell Blantons. <laughs> single barrel. Uh, Jim Beam comes up with a small batch. It's the sort of thing where normally you take something like a Buffalo Trace and they will use hundreds if not thousands of barrels to make a uh, make Buffalo Trace. Small batch depending on who's making it. It varies. It can be 10 barrels, it can be 100 barrels, it can be 30 barrels, it can be 60 barrels, but it's just a smaller sort of thing. Again, depending on what sort of flavor profile, which is the technical term they use, they will then choose whether it's a diagonal going through the rick house, or they will choose just a vertical, a horizontal going through on one level or something like that, or they'll pick from these three or four or five different warehouses, everybody has their own, but it's one thing that I find endlessly fascinating is just how, given the aging is really what makes the difference in the taste. You can buy one from over here, one from over there, one from over there, and you can come up with something completely new. And that just continues to blow my mind. In, uh, what was it, 1999, they finally get hit with stuff and they invent this thing called the Bourbon Trail. If anybody decides that they want to take a nice vacation and go down to Kentucky, they have a, basically a route, sort of like the, uh, what do the, the, the bicycle route here, the, the Green Trail, uh, I'm just spacing on the French for it. Uh, where you just go from distillery to distillery to distillery. They give tours. It's at Buffalo Trace. They have three di different types of tours. They have one which is basically is like a presentation like I'm giving here now. They have another one called the Hard Hat, Tour, which gives the history of the distillery. They have another one which is called the Hard Hat Tour, which takes you around and actually gets you involved in here's where we distill it, here's where we ferment it, here's where we bottle it, and so on. And then they have another one which is called After Prohibition, which concentrates a lot on the architecture and so on. And then of the dozen dis major distilleries that are there, I think it's 10 of them already have it. There's also now an urban, uh, what's called the urban trail, where it's you go from bar to bar to bar. And, um, and then yes, it's uh, hopefully, excuse me, next year for the uh, American whiskeys, we'll have some craft distilleries. Because there it's a sort of thing where with loosening of regulations on who and how you can make alcohol, it just sprouted up like mushrooms now. So now you're back to a situation where while it isn't like it was in the, say, 1850s or 1860s where there were just thousands of distilleries in Kentucky, there are thousands of distilleries now in the United States. It's, uh, I remember reading once that there are more distilleries in Vermont than there are in Ireland. And it's a sort of thing where what they are doing to American whiskey in the wild. There's this one called uh, Tullitown, which is down in uh, upstate New York. And it's the sort of thing where they have this thing called Hudson Baby Bourbon, which comes out in a 375 milliliter bottle, where they sell it for 45 to 50 bucks, which means it's the equivalent of $100 for a bottle. There, and apparently it got all sorts of awards, gold medals and everything like that. Their stick is that they will use small barrels as opposed to the 53 gal gallon barrels, they will use five gallon barrels. And then it's the sort of thing where their stick on how they make theirs extra special is, I've heard various conflicting reports, but either they play, uh, what do you call it, drum and bass music, like, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the children out there go dancing to a picnic electronic or I've heard Metallica. And it's the sort of thing where between the death metal or heavy metal and the drum and bass, the idea is to play it deafening level so that it agitates the alcohol in the barrel so that they get the similar effect as you get from aging, but just a lot quicker. And 
there are people, there's basically been a line drawn in the sand, and it's sort of thing, there are people who are saying, it's crap and you shouldn't pay attention to it, and there are other people saying, no, this is wonderful, this is wild, wild. this is amazing. To me, eyes open, I'd love to taste it and so on. Unfortunately, none of it's available at the SAQ yet, but if you push hard enough, you can get some. I've heard rumors and stuff from people trying to bring it in. Okay, hold on a second, I need some water. Yes, yeah, anybody been adding water to the bourbon? What are the differences you find with it? Okay. Now there's my preferred way of drinking bourbon, especially on a day like today, but obviously the logistics are impossible. There's large, large amounts of ice. This sort of thing, I have no problem adding water to the bourbon and uh, which I'll by cooling it down. This sort of thing where you hear people talk about big rocks and how you, which one that shouldn't dilute the whiskey all that much. It's the most famous cocktail made with bourbon, it's a mint julep, and that's made with shaved ice. And so it's the sort of thing to me, however you like, whatever your preference is, experiment, find, find out what you like, and then try that and always just keep an open mind. One of the things that I'm not systematically doing, but this whole thing about keeping, which one, uh, pouring a drink a day before I want it, and then drinking it. And that's just the taste difference between just leaving it out for overnight, for effectively 24 hours, is mind-boggling. And just not really And it's the sort of thing we're just trying to figure out what are the effects that happens with oxygen and the whiskey. And does it make it better, does it make it worse? Make this experiment and try all sorts of stuff. Okay, there are effectively three different types of mash bills. You'd think that everybody is trying to make something different, but it just this is where this is my learning. Where I thought going in that it was a mash bill that was going to change it. It's not. It's the aging. There's the traditional bourbon recipe, which is um, Bernie Lover. So this guy who does, uh, what is it called? The whiskeyprof.com. He is an ambassador for being global. And he's come out with a book on bourbon, which is nice and little bit sort of more of tour guide to Louisville and stuff like that, but still extremely informative. He's got a website where he's got Bourbon 101, Bourbon 201, Bourbon 301, and Bourbon 401, effectively courses on it that go with more and more technical detail. And so he uses a thing called the traditional bourbon recipe, which is 78% of the bourbon balance rinds and barley. And then he says, it's think sweet and spicy, back of the tongue experience. It's another thing with all whiskeys, not only bourbon, but where on the mouth do you feel it? Is it on the front of the tongue, the middle of the tongue, the back of the tongue, cheeks, back of the mouth? There's that high rye bourbon recipe, which is 18% or more rye. It brings the corn back down and keeps the same amount of barley, roughly, as a traditional recipe, which is roughly about 5 to 10%. It's the sort of thing where, I got it written down here someplace, but corn effectively turns, because it's so sweet, it effectively gives a lot of sugar that can be then turned into alcohol. The barley, I think it is, gives something where it just makes the whole chemical reaction happen a lot quicker. And rye gives some flavor, although it is the sort of thing where you don't need an awful lot of rye to give a lot of flavor. There's then also a wheat bourbon recipe, which is 7 to 8 percent corn, similar to the traditional, but instead of rye, you use wheat. And then, as he says, it allows the sweetness of the corn and the sugars from the barrel to be more pronounced. And that's why the bourbon's wheat whiskey is extremely, extremely sweet. Um, one of the things within the Rick House is that um, unlike Scotland, where they on average will lose 3% alcohol per year, and they call it the angel share, in Kentucky they will also lose which one, uh, an angel share, but it's not 3% per year. It depends on what floor it's on. 
And then also it's the sort of thing where if you put it on the lower floors where it is cooler, it's around 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's going to be about 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. It's the sort of thing where because at that temperature, the water molecules escape through the oak quicker than the alcohol molecules do. No, I got it backwards. The alcohol molecules will escape quicker than the water ones do. It will decrease in proof. And so it will go in at about 125 proof, 62.5% alcohol by volume. You wait a couple of years and it's down to, what, 60% alcohol by volume. You go up to the top, the top of the ninth one, because it is much, much hotter up there, the water escapes much quicker. And so there's the sort of thing the alcohol content actually raises. Yes, you lose more volume. You start out with 53 gallons, the 250 liters or so. And so after 10 years, you may have only half your barrel left. But the proof on that is going to be somewhere about 140, 160, which is 70 to 80 percent alcohol. Um, there's also, back when I did the presentation on Irish whiskey, I sort of poo pooed the idea that there was somebody saying that the darker a whiskey is, the more alcohol you have. And that was because in looking at the Irish, realizing that yes, they do add food color. Scottish, yes, they do add food color. Canadian, yes, they do add food color. To me, the whole idea that trying to judge the alcohol content based on color, that was ridiculous. However, with American whiskey, because you cannot add any coloring whatsoever, as the content of alcohol increases, the color gets darker. And if you put these in order, what is it? The Blanton's is 40, this one is 4.5, and this one is 50, so we 50. 44.5, we have here 45, 45, and we have here 45 as well. You probably all even have a difficult time seeing it, but darkest to lightest. And if you bring a paint white paper behind it and stuff like that, that'll work. Give me one second before I trip and kill myself. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, there, it's also, we should talk about the yeast strain. So there's a certain thing where you've heard sour mash. Jack Daniels is a sour mash whiskey. Bourbon is a sour mash whiskey. Basically, when you make a mash, the yeast is, yeah, the yeast is what converts a whole whack of things and your yeast strain converts it accounts for some flavor changes as well. It's not an awful large percentage, but it's still there. Somebody with all, yeah, from Bernie Lovers, he says, the flavor comes from 10% from the yeast strain, 15% from the distillation, 25% uh, from the small grains, and 50% from maturation. I'm not certain how he comes about that, but you get the basic sense that these are the variables that can change. And this is what he thinks they're worth. And it's a sort of thing where sour or sweet mash is where you basically take your grains, add water, cook them up, add the yeast, and use that to make your distillation, and then at which point, leave it. Sour mash is where you take from your previous dist uh, mash, add that in, so you're using the same yeast as you used previously. By adding it in, it turns it, it actually turns it sour. It's the sort of thing where if you think that the uh, mash bill, once it's all cooked up, is effectively beer. And it's the sort of thing you have a sour beer or you have a sweet beer. And uh, it's the sort of thing by adding the previous mash to the new mash, you get, it makes it sour. It's called sour mash. Oh, it, uh, no, there you're taking very small amounts. It's the sort of thing you do not need an awful a lot of yeast so as to get the uh, well, fermentation happening. So I would imagine if you're talking, which of the vats which hold thousands of gallons, millions of liters, you're probably adding in 100 liters, something like that. So maybe 1%, maybe 2%, not an awful lot at all. The idea if, is that um, wild yeast and bacteria doesn't like sourness. Well, yeast, any yeast doesn't really like sourness, but 
yeasts are better at transforming sugar into alcohol at a, in a sour environment. Yeah, that's true. And then, you know, so it's really just to prevent wild stuff to get into the uh, mash. Yeah, no, th think of, you've heard of sourdough bread? Sourdough bread is made the exact same way. You use a little piece of your old dough to start, it's called the mash. That then continues, and then from when you make the new bread, you keep a little bit aside so as to make the new, the next one. Yogurt is the same way where you take some of the old batch of bacteria, and toss it into the new so as to aid in the fermentation. Same, if, same exact cooking process. Um, yeah, we talked about the barrels. Um, Bernard Lebrus talks about there's six different types of vanillas you can get from a barrel, and it takes a good six years to get those vanillas out of a barrel. Uh, he basically concentrated, you can find maple, butterscotch, brown sugar, caramel, ginger, clove, toffee, cinnamon, nutmeg, orange, graham cracker, walnut, almond, butter, and yeast, bacon, toasted nuts, and many, many more flavors out of just alcohol in a barrel. One thing that is amazing about Buffalo Trace as a distillery is they're doing some serious, serious experimentation. Besides these five, and unfortunately none of the things that I'm going to talk about right now you can get in the SAQ, but if you go down to Kentucky, you can get them. They have, first of all, an antique collection, which is a series of four different bourbons that are all named after, well, I call them Civil War heroes. They're actually old master distillers or uh, directors of the distillery. And then they have this other thing called the experimental collection, where basically they're trying to figure out what makes the perfect bourbon. And so they have, within the experimental collection, they will change just one variable. They will say, okay, so we have this one mash bill. We're gonna put them all into, uh, what do you uh, This warehouse, we're gonna bend. This warehouse has this heating system. This warehouse has no heating system. So what is the effect and the change? They have another one which is called the One Oak Project, where they basically selected 80, it's 192 divided by 84 trees. They then, 84 oak trees, they then sliced them in half, top and bottom. From the top of the tree, they made a barrel. From the bottom of the tree, they made a barrel. They chose the trees based on the width of the distance between the rings and their growth. So each tree is different. They then put the same alcohol into all those 192 barrels, and they're tracking them. And at which point, once they come out, they say, okay, so is this good? Is this not good? They have another one where they now have, they just recently constructed this uh, warehouse X. Where it's basically it's a small warehouse. I think it probably would be a normal warehouse. Strip warehouse can hold like millions of gallons of uh, whiskey. This one I think is probably only uh, which one about three stories high, and which one that does employ it's effectively like craft distillery. But they can change the humidity. They can change the temperature. They can control the humidity. They can control the temperature. They can control the light. And it's the sort of thing where they're putting stuff in there so as to see. What are the effects and how these things change with the idea being that they want to then say, okay, this is a better bourbon in the same way that you prefer to remember correctly the uh, evil rare. And at which point your preference is that, so at which point you figure out, okay, so how can I make this more and more, more efficiently, easier, and so on. So that's one of the big things about how, uh, which all the distillers have done it. Back in the 50s, Buffalo Trace was not making as much whiskey as they are making now, but they had, they had a thousand employees. Now they are a much, much larger organization, but they're down to 350 employees. And it's not that the sort of thing where it's attrition and they had to get rid of people, it's that no, things were a lot more efficient and they just know a lot more. It's, everything is very technical. Um, <clears throat> yeah, according to Bernie Levers, he likes bourbons that are aged six to nine years. He says that at 12 years, most bourbons begin to lose their fight with the barrel and they are overaged and become over. Um, it's probably now about 830, 840 or something like that. Right. Let's go on to bourbon number four. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> This is now Hancock's. Which, as we noted, is not a straight bourbon whiskey. It is just a single barrel bourbon whiskey. It comes in at 
44.45% alcohol, which would be 89. Also, one thing for those, if you don't know, it's when you are uh, sniffing, if you sort of keep your mouth a little bit open, you get a much more sort of thorough flow of air through your mouth and it aids uh, immensely. to 100% more than they would be in the States. For the most part, prices of the LCBO and other Canadian outlets are roughly the same. It's a certain thing, choose to live here and get back and which point I'm going to put up with prices on the, on the birds. So who gets what out of this? Again, more Ryan. Yeah, Ryan at the end. Now this is this is going to these final three are all made with the same mash bill as well. We did a little bit more room for the water to get the port wood bit of char as well. Just when you think of the water brings out. Do you notice how notice anything that would make you think that is younger than um, the Blantis? Because given that it doesn't have the straight on it, my guess is this is less, less than two years old. I think this one is more balanced. It's, it's really well made. I, I feel like it's smoother. Yeah, alcohol is much smoother. Yeah. Like half yeah. You get that 4.5% more, but you don't close it at all. Yeah, it's a sort of thing to me I was surprised because in realizing that they're not straight bourbon, which therefore means that they're going to be younger. Well, so, I was surprised to figure out that, yeah, that these are mighty could tasty. Be, could be because they eat like a 12. Single, single barrel. It's also the sort of thing where I could be wrong. As it says it may be called straight, yes. but it doesn't have to be. But given how everybody knows to read a label, I would not be taking off the straight unless by law I had to. It could just be because of the, uh, the labeling. So they choose not to put it so this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now to also notice with the variety of bottled shapes, it's one of the things that I find always impressive with bourbons, because I think it's a, I haven't spent as much time concentrating on the scotches, but my understanding is scotches are pretty much the same bottles for the most part. You get the, this, but this is a, we have five completely different bottles. But no, there it's the sort of thing where back in the 60s. No, back in the 60s. Yes, back in the 60s with bourbons, they would come out with what were called um, not flasks, um, fancy porcelain containers. Um, pardon? Thank you, you can't use And it was the sort of thing where you get like, uh, what's called Jim Beam in a Santa Claus shaped decanter. Uh, or what's called uh, the 4th of July, you get one in sort of George Washington, the sort of thing people collected them. And it was the sort of thing given that. This is hand bottled, hand labeled. These two might be hand bottled as well. It's the sort of thing where Portland is just very hands-on as a, an industry, and it's the sort of thing we're to say, okay, we're going to be doing, making the fancy bottles so that they stand out on the, uh, on the shelf in the liquor store. With the taste on this, anybody think that this is their favorite now? Yeah. Okay. Um, there, got over that. 
Yeah, I'm glossing over a lot of the chemistry stuff, even though that's the sort of thing which, to me, is fascinating, where it's the chemistry is the sort of stuff which actually defines, this is what the smells are, this is where they're coming from, and so on. It is the sort of thing where, in a place with this much echo, after this much whiskey, and so on, I have a feeling, even that I'm not a chemistry teacher, it's not going to go over terribly well. Um, okay. So then, yeah, with regards to the distiller, which is the other thing I wanted to talk about, it started in uh, 1787, and it has been there. It's been a distillery continuously on the same property since then. Um, it has gone through, yeah, it was initially done by Benjamin Blanton, who went off to the 1849 California Gold Rush. Uh, it was sold to E.H. Taylor, who also is now a Bourbon label as well. He's the one who came up with Old Fire. It's not Old Fine. It's Old Fire Copper Distillery. And their OFC is now a Canadian whiskey brand. That got sold then to, Stead, uh, to George T. Stead, who is also a brand of whiskey now. And uh, he changed the name to Old Stead and Distillery. And then he hired a guy named Blanton, which is where you get Blanton's from. And then in 1929, the Shenley Corporation bought it, and they started producing bourbon in 1934. Um, yeah, in where does it go? Yeah, it got sold then in about 1960 to Sazerac, who then sold it to a Japanese group, which was called Age International. And they held a majority of ownership until they sold it back to Sazerac, which is actually a company based out of New Orleans. And then back in the late 90s, they changed it to Buffalo Trace. Um, yeah, basically Old Fashioned Copper to each Taylor and Company, the George T. Stegg Distillery, to the Shenley Distillery, to the Ancient Age Distilling Company, to the Leestown Distilling Company, to, Sad to Buffalo Trace. And that's basically the history of it. Um, Any questions? So ready for number five? <laughs> you already done number five? And so we have here now number five, which is the Rock Hill Farms. Again, it doesn't have straight on it, so my guess would be it's a young one. It is the strongest of the bunch. It comes in at 50% alcohol by volume. This is proof. This is 100 proof. The proof comes from back in the 17 and 1800s. It was the sort of thing where how your whiskey was made, nobody was sure. And so it was the sort of thing, given that everybody carried guns, it was the sort of thing you pour a little bit of your alcohol onto some gunpowder. And if it burned, it was proof that it was alcohol. It's it was uh, fizzled and sputtered. It was below proof. If it sort of went off like a firecracker, it was over proof. And basically, proof means that it's basically 50% alcohol by volume. What are the differences between the Rock Hill Farms and the Hancock? Which one is sweeter? Rock, the five Rock Hill Farms? Now, that's where I wish I could know which part of the warehouse and which warehouse made what flavors.
no longer a single barrel, but it's still a bourbon. So yes, no, they do come up a certain thing after the whole single barrel into small batch, the whole idea of, okay, we are going to make it so that these are super premium type of whiskeys. They're now doing all sorts of fancy stuff. And so yes, there is age and so on. And ultimately to me, it comes down to like, my favorite preferred whiskey, preferred bourbon, Jim Beam White Label. It goes down easy. It's nice that people who will poo-poo it and say it's speed rail, it's crap and so on. It does the trick for me and recognizing that's nice, that's my normal just daily bourbon, but there are lots and lots of fancy ones. One of the advantages of bourbon is, yeah, that $200 is about the most expensive bourbon you can get on the SAQ would probably charge about, actually no, I think they charge only about 200 bucks for here. But it's the sort of thing where they do have whiskeys, uh, scotches, that are like $20,000. And so yes. It's Buffalo Trick who actually has the contract out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, they switched it because they, they still, the distillery still closed. And it's a, it's a heated uh, bourbon. Yep. There was another earlier that you said that one of the distillers did not age as well, or it should, it should be drank as a whiskey. Do you have any examples of that? 
Is this something we should think about when we have organs? Is that something we can keep for a long time? Is that something we should see? No, 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 no. Once it's in the bottle, it stops. It's it pretty much, if you don't keep it in direct light like any whiskey, yeah. it's, it's pretty much good to go. It's a sort of thing, and yes, yeah, then it's just what is your preference? And I'm just playing around with, if you leave the top off, it will affect the flavors. You put the top on, and it doesn't change the flavors at all. It's only light and air that will change it. That's to your place. There is some change that takes a long time. Effectively, yeah. OB, yeah. OB, no power factor. Yes. Thank you very much.